dear attendees please accept my greetings so now i'll be talking about the historical background of this subject chronobiology and a little bit of the latest development in chronobiology so if you look at the early studies then you'll find that uh, uh, around uh, 1500 bc there is a mention of about the chronobiological principle in ayurveda and if you look at the practical side of the scriptures in ayurveda specifically its guidelines for an intelligently regulated diet and daily routine its techniques for stress management and its exercises for increased fitness alertness take control of our lives and development for radiant health then if you look at the first observation of biological rhythms then it dates back to 350 bc and uh, it was andosthenes who discovered sleep movement in tamarind syndica then there are many other important persons who observed the rhythms in various uh, organisms including human beings so let's look at the hufeland 1797 almost about 200 years ago then we have uh, sanctorius who observed day night variations in the pulse rate and the pulse rate here then davy who discovered a daily rhythm in the body temperature in 1845 so hufeland also stressed that there is a biological variability in all kinds of diseases and he discovered that there is a periodicity of about 24 hours so then we have uh, vire who you can consider as the first chronopharmacologist who says that all medicines are not equally indicated effective given at different hours of the day so this is uh, as early as 1814 so then there was another scientist astronomer jean jack dortu de maria he observed sleep wake rhythms in a heliotrope plants in 1729 and uh, he could see that uh, you know even inside a complete dark room the rhythmicity in the leaf movements daily leaf movements that continues undisturbed so probably this is the first study that talks about the innate property of the biological rhythm that way back in 1729 then there are a number of illustrious chronobiologists you know we have asof 1913 to 1998 we have franz halberg 1919 to 2016 
then we have Hildebrandt, 1924-1999, then we have Bunning, 1906-1990, and we have also Jesse Bose, so, uh, who talks about the leaf closing and uh, leaf opening rhythms. Now, if you look at a picture of the fourth conference of the International Society of Biological Rhythms, then you'll find the Halberg here, then we have Asaf and Menzel, Jors and Kalmus and Hildebrand. And Hildebrand is probably the person who talked about uh, rhythms in, you know, you know, the medicines, you know, medical parameters, rhythms in, you know. and uh, we have also in India, the doings of Indian chronobiology. We have J. P. Tapliel, 1922 to 2016. And then we have uh, M. K. Chandrasekharan, so Madurai Kamraj University, 1937 to 2009. They contributed significantly to the chronobiology and especially to the chronobiology in India. Then we have Asaf and Weaver from Germany who performed pioneering experiments on human circadian rhythms. And Klitman in 1963 were the first to study human circadian rhythms uh, wh where subjects were shielded from the periodic environmental cue. So there are number of such studies, you know, in 1930, the Klitman and his colleagues descent into a cave for a week. In 1957, Mary Loban and her colleagues in the Arctic Ocean during summer midnight sun, this continuous light, nine solar days were equivalent to only eight days with a 27-hour period. And the uh, urine flow, they found eight peaks and urinary potassium rhythm nine peaks. In 1961, in a Munich bunker experiment, Asops studied a female subject who stayed inside the bunker for 28 days. And then in 1962, Michael Schiffer descended into a 375 feet deep cave and stayed there for 62 days and studied, you know, sleep wake rhythm, the self self wake rhythm for about 62 days. This is a symbolic, uh, you know, daily variations in physiology and behavior that are an integral part of life. So now see in the daytime, this plant is, uh, you know, and in the night, the plant is sleeping. So in contrast, the owl is sleeping during the daytime and very active during the night time. And in case of mammals, it is just the reverse. So if you look at the intensity of light, then you see it's very high intensity light during the daytime and uh, intensity of light is less in the night. But if you look at the artificial uh, uh, lighting in the offices during the daytime and also see the illumination uh, of the cities during the night. So you'll find that uh, some of the cities during the night they look like uh, as if it is daytime. So artificial uh, illumination, artificial light. So, if you look at uh, 
the human subjects they are very often exposed to artificial lights of different uh, spectra and uh, it's a very common phenomenon these days even the small kids before going to sleep they look at the devices uh, that uh, has electromagnetic uh, radiations coming out of that so here the main problem is that the brightness of the light and if it is, if you look at the tablet then you will find that there is more blue and uh, in candlelight there is very less blue so that means the brightness is a important factor that uh, causes uh, sleep delay at night. So now if we summarize then you'll find that light is supposed to be the principal synchronizer of the biological clock. So light is perceived by the eyes and transmitted to the suprachiasmatic nucleus through RST and then the suprachiasmatic nucleus which is uh, you know can be called as the master clock that regulates many peripheral clocks and also regulates number of physical activities as you see in these pictures. And of late we have information that food and feeding regimens they are also very very important and uh, they can they have the ability to synchronize peripheral clocks uh, at different uh, tissues, so fat cells, liver, uh, GI tract, and uh, all these areas. So, what we can see that organism possesses functional clocks at all levels of biological integration, whether it is molecular level, tissue level organ level and the whole body at all the levels of biological integration we do have clocks so this is a cartoon diagram illustrating different uh, activities around the clock so now this shaded area is the area is a generalized area when one human subject goes to bed or, go, um, at, uh, or uh, sleep and then wakes up at say for example 7 o'clock and then again goes to the sleep at uh, 11 p.m. So now let, let's see one example that means the growth hormone is more at the time of going to bed and it remains higher during the period of sleep. Now you see the labor pain and spontaneous delivery. So and it has a correlation with the physiology of the human body. So if you look at this, you see that plasma oxytocin is more at around 4 o'clock. Whether it is a old lady or a young lady, it doesn't matter. But it is more, plasma oxytocin is more um, between 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning, early morning. And this is the reason why, you know, most of the spontaneous delivery is taking place around that time. So similarly, cortisol, that is more in morning hours, your lungs capacity is more here, your muscular uh, power is more here, and body temperature is at uh, uh, 3 p.m. Then arterial pressure is maximum at uh, 5 p.m. and so on. So <clears throat> this is a so now you know chronobiology is a field of biology that examines 
periodic phenomena in living organisms and their adaptation to solar and lunar related rhythms. These cycles are known as biological rhythms and chronobiology comes from the ancient Greek word chronos meaning time and biology which pertains to the study or science of life. So if you look at the important uh, chronobiologist who contributed significantly for the development of this branch, uh, they are Forney 1958, Bunning 1967, Halberg 1969, and Randberg 1969. So I have highlighted these two um, personalities, that is Halberg and Renberg, because I was uh, associated with them. And uh, Professor Halberg was uh, the P uh, PhD thesis examiner uh, of uh, uh, mine. And uh, with Renberg, I did the postdoctoral uh, in Paris. So, <coughs> Franz uh, visited us uh, uh, in Raipur and uh, you can see that uh, uh, we uh, in the year 2005 and uh, we had a discussion on different aspects how we can collaborate uh, and uh, there was a BioCos uh, program and we became the member of the BioCos group and uh, published a uh, number of papers uh, in a collaborative attempt. So then, this is the picture of uh, Professor Ryan Bjerg, and uh, this is the again the pictures in interaction with Professor Ryan Bjerg at Israel, and that is the the third International Congress of Applied Chronobiology and Chronomedicine. And in 2009. So the coining of the circadian, this term, who coined this? So it is Alberg who coined this in 1959 and it was unanimously accepted in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium Quantitative Biology in 1960. So now I'll take you back to 1982 and uh, this this is the title of my phd thesis and you can read it chronohematological and chronophysiological studies in a reptile with special reference to environment so at that time i was studying the biological clock of the water snake genocrophis piscator i just discovered in uh, Natrix, or you can say Genocrophis piscata, uh, a diurnal variation in plasma fatty acid uh, along a 24 hour time scale. So, if you look at the 9 o'clock, you will find that plasma fatty acid is less than 40 milligram per deciliter, whereas at 9 pm, the plasma fatty acid is more than uh, 100 milligram per deciliter. So this uh, one can call this as a circadian variation in the level of plasma fatty acid in genocropis piscata. Topotometer, and there is something wrong in, in your observations. But in 2017, three physiologists of US, they received Nobel Prize for working on the circadian rhythm, the molecular mechanism controlling the circadian rhythm. And uh, I, was, I was so happy that this, uh, the humiliation that we faced in 1982 is really, you know, it's very difficult to forget, but now look at this. In 2017, Nobel Prize is awarded to three American physiologists. For what? 
because they deciphered the inner molecular chemistry of the circadian clock using fruit fly as the model organism. The remaining part of this uh, talk I'll be delivering in the next chapter. Thank you. Continuing from the previous uh, delivery, their research explains how living organisms synchronize their circadian rhythms with uh, the day-night cycle of the nature. So, what they found, now you see this is the daytime and this is the night time, they found that the period gene expression takes place at this time. You see, this is the daytime. And uh, the product is a power protein and which uh, goes into the cytoplasm. And then thereafter what happens that power protein again enters into the nucleus and suppresses the expression of its own gene. Now you see here, this per protein is no longer available in the cytoplasm. And the whole process, all the six steps you find here, that uh, completes this time span of 24 hours. What happens further, they thought probably the per protein alone is not doing everything. So they discovered another protein, so called timeless protein, and they found that the per protein and time protein, they together enter into the nucleus and inhibits, and inhibits the expression of their own genes. So now you see the discovery of these clock mutants lay the foundation for the molecular analysis of circadian rhythms. So much for the fly rhythms, but can these molecular mechanisms be extended to cover mammalian circadian system? Answer is yes. There is plenty of work now. We know we have a lot of information how these uh, molecular uh, molecules are uh, regulating the circadian rhythms in mammals. So now you see, in, um, in summary you can say that we have both clock regulators as well as we have clock disruptors. So if you go into the detail, then you'll find that we have number of clock regulators, say for example, glucocorticoids, body temperature, then uh, vasoactive intestinal peptides, then you know food, timing of the food, and quality of the food, then day and night cycle, and then glutamate. So they are all you know regulating uh, the circadian clock at uh, different levels. So then if you look at the uh, clock disruptors, then you will find that mutations, aging, lesions or tumors, jet lag, light at night, and shift work. They are the most notable disruptors of the clock. So, in a nutshell, what I can say that in summary, circadian rhythm research is multi and transdisciplinary and is a very promising field for in-depth investigators in the following areas. The temporal aspects of the ecology, the impact of artificial lighting and uh, heating on human clock function, improving medical diagnosis and treatment, to decreasing the risk of 
shift work by developing more biologically adapted social schedules and to study the ultradian and infradian rhythms about which uh, our knowledge is very limited. Then another question arises, when should I take my medicines? And uh, when, at what time the medicine will be more effective? So this comes, this comes under the application aspects of uh, chronobiology and my colleague Professor Arti Parganya will be speaking about chronomedicines and chronotherapy. Thank you very much, all attendees.